As we start episode 6, the episode begins with a woman named Mary Kelly walking out of a hotel and going through a dark alley where she's grabbed by an unknown person. A few days later, a present is left at the police precinct and when Henry opens the box, he discovers a human heart. Joe and Mike then go through missing people's reports for 25 and 30 year old women and using the information Henry got by examining the heart, they figure out the woman is probably a prostitute called Mary Kelly. Henry is stunned when he hears the name as it brings back a memory from a long time ago. The three then go to the hotel Mary used to hang out in, but Henry looks around and finds the exact route Mary went. He and Joe conclude Mary was probably held close by, but as Joe looks in the alley, Henry figures out that Mary was taken to the butcher shop in front of the street. In a brief flashback, we're taken to London in 1888 and we see Henry arriving at a crime scene and it cuts back to the present time and Henry reveals the killer is a copycat of Jack the Ripper. They find Mary's body cut up and Henry concludes that this is a person that studied Jack the Ripper very diligently from the name of the women that he killed to the way that he actually committed the murders and the killing is almost a perfect copy. We then see Henry getting a call from Adam who asks him about the kill and reveals that he's also in London when Jack the Ripper killed Mary Kelly. He then tells him that he hopes that this time he'll be able to catch the killer as Jack the Ripper was never caught. Henry starts looking around as the news of the killing has not reached the outside, but when he runs outside looking for Adam, he only finds a burner phone on a car. Later that day, we see scrambling in his home to find his old notes on the killings. He's also freaked out that Adam knows a lot about Jack the Ripper, and since he was never caught, Adam might actually be him. Henry does figure out the killer used a Liston knife, an extremely rare surgical tool with only a hundred left, and this kind of item is only bought at an antique shop, so he asks Abe to visit the Frenchman to ask for info. The next morning Henry was doing an autopsy on Mary's body, and he has not found any fingerprints or the DNA of the killer. The body is also cut in the exact same way that Jack the Ripper used to cut, except for one part. Henry remembers the cut on the original Mary's arm was actually a semicircle, but this one has a star. And this reveals that the killer is not actually Jack the Ripper, and that the only way the killer thought that he could cut Mary's arm like a star is because he read an article written by the Manchester Herald who got that part wrong when they reported it at the time. The Manchester Herald has not existed since 1889, and the only copy would be found in the library. Henry and Jill then rush to the library and search for a person who took out the newspaper, and they find a fake name at first, but they match the handwriting to a person right in the library. The guy runs away as soon as he sees them, and as Joe runs after him and captures him, Henry gets a call from Adam, who tells him that the killer left a clue in the last crime scene, which revealed that he will next copy the Black Dahlia. The guy is brought in for investigation, but he reveals that he only read about Jack the Ripper because he's a writer of a graphic novel called Soul Slasher, which depicts killings of serial killers. He then tells them that he ran away because he thought that they were fans, and reveals that some of his fans are psychotic and that they claim that they actually killed people. The police then get a call about another body and they find a woman killed in a way of the Black Dahlia, but this time, Henry finds the next clue and figures out the next killing will be in the way of the Boston Strangler. While this is going on, Abe visits the Frenchman, who's actually a woman, and he asks her politely to show him her sales book. Unfortunately, she responds by saying no, and then offers to sleep with him. But Abe was not really interested in her, which I don't really get, but he accomplishes his goal by stealing her book. Later that night, Henry looks through the list and finds out the name of the killer, and the police then raid the home of the Bentleys and arrest their son Devin after finding him typing on the fan page. Devin is then quickly brought into custody, but he seems unbothered when he is questioned about Mary's death. He denies doing it, but he's also happy that he's getting accused because he believes that this will make him famous in the Soul Slasher community. Henry and Joe are convinced that Devin is the killer, but they have no evidence, so his father Mark picks him up shortly after. And later that night, Henry informs Joe that he's got the sales book and that they can use that as evidence, but since they stole the book, if the Frenchman reports it stolen, their case will be dismissed on a technicality. Joe then goes to a judge to get a warrant for the book, while Henry goes to return 
return to the Frenchman. He apologizes to Frenchman and tells her the situation and she agrees to help them out. She then says that he is lucky that she remembers that uptight man, revealing to Henry that the killer is not Devin, but his father, Mark. He then rushes out of the store to notify Joe, but Mark was waiting for him outside and stabs him and Mark then blindfolds the Frenchman and as he prepares to kill her, Henry uses all his energy to go back in and try to stop him. But unfortunately, Henry was too weak and he's thrown to the basement. But as Mark goes back up, he's confronted by Joe who just got there and when he tries to take out his gun, she shoots and kills him. Meanwhile, Henry was bleeding to death, but he still had a few minutes left, and if Joe sees him die in front of her, and then witnesses him alive the next day, his cover will be blown. He was even too weak to off himself, but Adam comes out out of nowhere, and slits his throat and kills him. Henry wakes up in the river, and life continues, but he gets fixated on how easily with no emotion Adam kills, and in the final scene of the episode, Henry gets a call from Adam, who tells him that he is just a child, and with time, he will also become desensitized about killing and death. When we start episode 7, the episode opens with a philanthropist, Dr. Tyler Forster, getting the Hero Award for opening a free clinic and helping everyone he can. He seems distressed when he gets the award, and he is found dead the next morning. Henry and Joe examine the crime scene, and figure out the killer was led into the room, so it must have been a person Tyler knew, and they also find a tattoo on his chest that was written in Roman numerals. They then talk to his wealthy father, who tells them that Tyler has cut off his family, for years now, for reasons he doesn't know, and that Tyler also had no money, so the killing might not be tied to him being rich. The next day, Joe and Henry go to the funeral and meet with Tyler's high school friends, Carter, Paul, and Cassandra. Carter tells them that he's the one that presented him with the Hero Award, but that Tyler didn't stay long at the party because he had an early shift. Henry then asks Carter about the day to June 10, 2005, to which Carter responds that that day didn't really ring a bell. Both Joe and Henry immediately figure out that Carter is lying by his expression, but they couldn't confront him, and Henry has figured out that the tattoo on Tyler's body is a specific date, and he finds that date on a picture with all four friends. They then talk to Tyler's mom about the picture, and she informs them that June 10 was the day that Tyler and his friends graduated from high school, and she tells them that the group went for a vacation right after graduation, but that Tyler returned a few days later alone. She also tells them that this is when Tyler suddenly became cold and left his family home, and he also refused to take any money from his family and quit Harvard. When Henry returns to his office, he is met by Lucas who has found a woman's hair in Tyler's body, and with this revelation, Henry and Joe continue their investigation by talking to Paul, Carter, and Cassandra alone. Paul reveals that Tyler used to be in love with Cassandra, but since Paul was dating her, he couldn't really do much about it. But then, Carter also reveals that he's been hooking up with Cassandra. Cassandra reveals that she went to see Tyler because she missed him, but she didn't tell Paul or Carter because they would get jealous. Henry figures out that the love square still continued to this day and that the killing might have something to do with that. And they get their big break on the case when a recording on Tyler's laptop was recovered. They play the recording and they see Tyler trying to apologize about a guy named Robert, but before he could say anything, Paul appears in the recording and closes the laptop. Henry and Joe then rush to Paul's apartment, but they find him on the brink of death, overdosing on drugs. Henry manages to make Paul throw up and save his life, but Paul is taken to the hospital and he wouldn't be able to talk to them till the next day. Henry and Joe then continue their investigation on Robert and they find out that he was a 17 year old kid that was reported missing two days after Tyler and his friends graduated high school. They also find out that Paul had gone to a gas station close to where Robert used to live after Tyler's funeral. The two then go to the gas station and ask the owner Morris to show them the security tape from the day and when they go through the footage they see Paul and Carter throwing a bag into the dumpster and when they rush to the dumpster they find a shovel. They then go into the woods with a search party, and they find Robert's skeleton buried. The next morning, all three suspects are brought in for investigation, and all of them confess that they accidentally hit and killed Robert when they were drunk driving one night. Cassandra was the one driving and made everyone promise not to tell anyone, but the night of Tyler's death, he tells them that he was going to confess, but this still doesn't show who the killer is, as all of them actually deny that they killed him and tell Joe and Henry that they only tried to convince him. Henry then remembers that Robert was wearing the gas station uniform, revealing that Morris knew that they killed the kid. Morris then blackmailed Tyler into giving him
him money, but after 10 years, Tyler had enough and wanted to confess. But Morris couldn't allow this to happen and went to his apartment to intimidate him, but things got out of hand and he ended up killing him. Henry and Joe then go back to the gas station, but Morris shoots Henry on the arm and tries to run away. Joe catches up to him, but she starts remembering killing Mark, which makes her hesitate for a few seconds, but when Morris tries to shoot Henry again, she shoots him on the arm and stops him. And as the episode wraps up, we learn that Cassandra, Carter, and Paul will only go to prison for a few years for accidentally killing Robert and lying about it. As we start off episode 8, it begins with Richard complaining about his work to his therapist, Iona, and she stops him in the middle of his sentence and orders him to take off his jacket, which she does with excitement, and she then cuffs his hands and whips him with her belt, and one might ask, what kind of therapy is this? And apparently she's a dominatrix therapist. Richard is found dead in the middle of the street, and when Henry and Lucas remove his clothes, they find whip scars all over his body. Henry figures out that the scars were voluntary, and that his death probably came from choking. Joe brings his wife Gwyneth in, and she reveals that her marriage with her husband almost failed, but since meeting Iona, Richard has changed for the better, and that their marriage was saved. Gwyneth further explains that Richard doesn't have sex with Iona, and that the therapy was about letting his guard down, as Richard worked in a world where any weakness might be exploited. Later that day, Henry and Joe visit Iona at her office, and they ask her what she did with Richard the night before, but she refuses to tell them, citing client confidentiality. Joe then looks around the office and finds a hanging station where Iona chokes her clients. Iona is then arrested and brought in for questioning, and the cause of death has been ruled choking, and Iona Iona chokes her client, so Joe asks her if this time it went wrong, but Iona was confident in her ability to do her job well, and she even argues that Richard didn't die from choking, rather he died of electrocution, which Henry also figures out right after she says it. Henry concluded it was choking because of the mark on Richard's neck, but that was from Iona's session, and with further examination, Richard's lungs showed signs of electrocution. This made Henry feel quite dumb, as he never really gets things wrong. He then visits Iona at her office, later at night and asks her about the electrocution and she tells him that it's something that she does rarely and she then offers to tie him up and show him how she does it which he nervously agrees to. She handcuffs him and asks him who hurt him in his life for him to be this distant with people and it then cuts to a flashback and we see his wife Nora crying at his tombstone after his first death. But he appears at the graveyard alive and with only a scar of the gunshot and the two lovers get reunited. Our scene then cuts back to the present time and Iona is getting ready to start her treatment, but before she could do anything, Mike and Joe break into her office and arrest her for murder. The taser used to kill Richard was found and it was hers, and she claims that she didn't do it and that it must have been stolen, and she also tells them that she was with a client at the time of Richard's death, but refuses to tell them who the client is, and Henry believes her, so he and Joe go back to the office to look for the evidence, but what they find is a wire bug. They track down the private investigator who did this, and he reveals to them that Gwyneth hired him. Gwyneth is then brought in for questioning, and she reveals that she hired the investigator because she wanted to know what Iona did that made her husband great again, and she also reveals that she was actually Iona's client at the time of Richard's death, clearing both women of his murder. Iona is then released immediately, and she finds Henry outside waiting for her, and she tells him that she wants to see him again, and this time not professionally, and she kisses him on the cheek before leaving. Later that day, Henry was walking to his bike to go home, but a masked man comes with a van and kidnaps him. Henry wakes up in a garage tied up, and Cliff tells him that Iona is his and that he's going to kill him slowly, and as Henry gets shocked, it cuts to another flashback and we see Henry getting taken to a mental hospital after Nora reported him. He had told her what happened but she didn't believe him and reported him to be crazy. We don't know when he got out of the mental hospital, but we know that it was hard to trust anybody after that. Meanwhile, Joe gets a call from Abe, who tells her that Henry has not come home, and when she goes outside, she finds his pocket watch on the side of the street, and she then immediately watches the security footage and watches a tattooed man abducting Henry. Joe recognizes the tattoo and remembers that it was one of Iona's clients. She then goes to Iona, who reveals the identity of the client to be Cliff, and she reveals Cliff used to be a daily client, but recently he started leaving inappropriate messages, which made her downgrade him to a weekly client. She also tells Joe that she gave his time for Richard, which makes Cliff the most probable 
probable suspect. Joe and her team then drive to Cliff's home and shoot and kill him right before he kills Henry. And the episode ends with Henry walking through the neighborhood, and he finally decides to join the crew for the first time at their hangout place, and everyone was excited to see him, especially Lucas, who always thought Henry just didn't like him. When we get to episode 9, it starts with Izzy buying drinks for the ladies in a jazz club, and the bartender Rudy asks Izzy for the money that he owes him for previous drinks, but Izzy brags that he's going to get rich soon so he shouldn't have to worry about the money. Izzy then gets up to leave and sees Al Rainey, and he tells him that he has proof and that soon the world will see who he really is. We follow Izzy as he gets inside his car, but there was someone waiting for him to strangle him to death. The next morning, he's found dead and his body burned to a crisp, and the police first think that it was a drinking accident, but as always, Henry comes in and after examining the body for seconds, he rules it as a murder. Joe manages to get a hold of his sister Ella, who reveals to them that he called her later that night, and that their father Pepper gave him something that will make him rich. Henry and Jill then track down Pepper and break the news to him, and Pepper tells them that he only gave Izzy his old audio tapes because Izzy was obsessed with them. Henry goes back home and asks Abe if he knows the name Pepper, and Abe tells him that Pepper was a prodigy, and even worked with the legendary Lionel who wrote the song 6AM. He also tells him that the name of the jazz club Izzy would have most likely been, so Henry and Joe travel to the club. They talk to Ruby, who doesn't give them much information, but Henry finds Izzy's briefcase hidden by Rudy. Rudy is then taken into custody, but he reveals that he took the briefcase as a collateral because Izzy owed him a lot of money. He also tells them that Izzy claimed that his father wrote the popular song 6AM, and that the night he died, he was bragging about having the proof. Lucas and Henry figure out the time of death and clear Rudy's name as he was seen at work when Izzy died. And with this new piece of information that they got from Rudy, they all go to Al Rainey's studio to ask him about the track. He tells them that the song was written by Lionel, and he even lets them listen to the first recording which proves that, but here he notices Al Rainey had recently burnt off arm hair, but Joe tells them that that's not enough to arrest him. Harry and Joe then go to do an autopsy, and they find a ring with the initials DB, meaning Dovebirds, which is a recording company owned by Al Rainey. They bring him in for custody, but they still have no actual proof, and Henry then looks through the briefcase one more time, and finds a secret compartment with Pepper's recording, and he then tries to play it in front of everyone, but the tape was damaged. Joe then calls back in to ask Pepper if he really wrote the song, and he tells her that he wrote it for Ella, as she was born at 6am, but that Al then cut him out of his own song, then Joe notices the ring on her desk and leaves immediately. Meanwhile, Henry has taken the tape to Abe, and Abe fixes it by cooking it in the oven for a few minutes, and he then plays the tape and it actually reveals that Pepper wrote the song, and even more, it reveals that DB was the nickname of Lionel. Lionel has been dead for 15 years, but his son Bud has taken the royalties, and they also find out that Bud is performing at the club that night, so they all rush to get him there. That night, we see Bud performing, and Pepper is also there with a gun to avenge his son, but before he could shoot Bud, Henry stops him and tells him that he still needs to be a dad for Ella and convinces him not to throw his life away. Bud is then arrested and confesses for the crime, and he also reveals that Al was the one that burned the body, so both of them get sent to prison. And this episode wraps up with Abe teaching Henry, who only loved classical music, how to play jazz. When we get to episode 10, it opens with Colin and his fiancée Emily celebrating their engagement, and we see them plan their wedding to be in his family's castle, as he is a royal. The next morning, Colin is found dead in Central Park, and Henry was on his day off, but since Colin was a Brit, Joe calls him in thinking that he'd be interested. Henry arrives at the scene and immediately figures out that Colin is not actually a royal, since the family name that he claimed has all been dead. Henry and Lucas do further investigation and find Colin is actually an American, and Henry also figures out that Colin's suit was only found in one place in New York, which is where he gets his suits done. He and Joe then go to the tailor, and he tells them that Colin always paid in cash, and he tells them that he was going to marry Emily, and while Joe talks talks to the employees inside, Henry follows the man that had the same kind of scar on his leg as Colin. He stops the guy and shows him the picture of Colin, and the man immediately recognizes the picture and tells him his real name is actually Dwight, and that he used to be a bike messenger like him, and he tells him that he disappeared a year ago and that he hadn't seen him since. Emily is then brought in for questioning, but Joe and Mike quickly figure out that she doesn't know anything, and they reveal to her his real name, and that he was actually a con artist. Meanwhile, Lucas finds a torn up check for a million dollars in Dwight's coat, and they figure out that the owner of the check to be Norman Sontag, Emily.
Emily's father. They then show the check to Emily and she reveals to them that it was for their wedding. Henry and Joe then go to Norman's house and talk to him about Dwight and he tells them that he hasn't seen him since 10 last night, but Henry figures out that Dwight and Norman had a fight based on the way Norman was walking. He also figures out that Norman hit Dwight with a golf club, so Norman was brought into custody immediately and his lawyer Peter joins him shortly and tells him not to say anything. But Norman caves and tells Joe that Dwight came after the engagement party to confess and he told him that he was a con man but that he had fallen in love with Emily and he then told him that he will also confess to Emily and if she forgave him, he will leave with her. Norman then got mad and they got into a fight but he tells them that he didn't kill him. Meanwhile, Henry continues investigating Dwight's clothes and figures out that there was no way that Dwight learned how to fake being British alone and he then checks who bought the clothes and an employee in the store named Patricia comes up. The police then search her house, but she was nowhere to be found, and they find a tape of her and Dwight training being British, and the recordings also reveal that they were in love. The next day, Henry joins Abe at a funeral for an old friend, and Henry then sees Emily with a lawyer, and he then sees Patricia from afar, also getting into her car after attending the funeral, and he then calls Joe and tells her what's happening and Patricia is caught. She tells them that Dwight told her that he was in love with Emily and that he wanted to confess, and she then reveals that Central Park was the place that he proposed to Emily and with only one true suspect left, Henry comes up with a plan to arrest Emily and claim that they found the murder weapon and that night, Peter comes back to Central Park to dig up his murder weapon and Joe and her team catch him in the act. And in the last scene of the episode, Joe walks Henry to a cab and Henry gets in and it's revealed that Adam is the driver. 